What's up everybody, how's it going? So I want you to imagine something. Imagine that you're a software engineer at a company, let's say Google for example, and one day you come home from work and at midnight you get a ping from one of your coworkers and they tell you that there's a bug in production, the entire website of the product that you're working on is down, they're trying to figure out what's wrong, they ask you for help, you go to help, your entire team is trying to figure out what the issue is, and eventually you figure out the issue, you fix it in production, and it turns out that the issue was one line of code that was buggy, that was causing the entire website to be down, and you wrote that line of code. What happens then? Well, this is going to be the topic of this video. A few weeks ago when I did my Q&As about life at Google, someone asked this very question and I said that I would dedicate an entire video to this topic. Well, this is this video. We're talking about the concept of a blameless post-mortem culture. As its name suggests, a blameless post-mortem culture is a culture in which you do not blame anybody for an outage or for a bug in production. Now we'll look at the post-mortem part of it in a couple of minutes, but first let's try to understand the blameless aspect of it. Why is it that it's so important not to blame someone for an outage or for buggy code, especially if they are actually kind of responsible because they wrote the buggy code. So let's dissect the scenario that I presented just earlier. Imagine that I wrote a line of code that was buggy, and that line of code made the entire website of the product that I'm working on go down. Should I be blamed? Well first let's analyze this objectively. Objectively, I should be blamed at least a little bit because I wrote the line of code. I'm the person who wrote the bug. So clearly, I do deserve some blame. But two of my teammates reviewed my code and approved it, and they didn't catch my bug in their code review. So they're equally to blame. And if they're more senior than me, then arguably they're even more to blame because they really should have caught that bug. And also, why didn't the bug get caught in automatic testing? Like for instance, if the bug caused our entire website to go down, like all the pages to go blank, then why didn't we have integration tests to catch that? Clearly there's an issue in our system as a whole. Our system is to blame as well. Why didn't we have any manual testing before this code got shipped to production? We could have caught this issue in manual testing, so there's also an issue in our process. Our deployment process is to blame. So as you can see, even though I'm the one who wrote the buggy line of code, I'm not the only person or thing to blame. There are other people to blame as well, and there are processes and systems that are to blame. And this doesn't only apply to a buggy line of code. For example, a lot of outages at Google are caused by config changes. Someone makes a configuration change, and that causes an outage. By the way, if you don't know what configuration is, go check out my product, Systems Expert. We give you one of the best courses on systems design fundamentals on the market. It's a great product to use if you're preparing for your systems design interviews. Go check it out, systemsexpert.io, and use the promo code CLEM, C -L -E -M, for a discount on the platform. But as I was saying, you could make a configuration change that causes an outage, and similarly, you wouldn't be the only person to blame for having made that faulty configuration change. You could blame the process. Why were you allowed to make that configuration change? Why weren't there tests that caught whatever bug occurred after the configuration change was made? The point is, objectively, there's almost never just a single person to blame. There are often other people to blame and other processes and systems and things in place to blame. But putting aside the objective stuff for a second, we can look at this a little bit more subjectively. Should I be blamed for having written that line of code that caused the bug? Well, what's blaming me going to accomplish? It's going to make me feel like shit and it might make me not really want to work here anymore or not feel as productive as before. It's going to make everybody else on the team feel like shit, because suddenly they're going to be thinking, what if I write a buggy line of code? Am I going to be blamed? It's going to create just a toxic environment in your team. And you're not really getting anything out of it. Blaming someone for having written a buggy line of code doesn't really lead to anything that's actionable. Telling someone write better code or write less buggy code isn't really actionable. So all that to say, that's why blaming someone for having written a buggy line of code and for having caused an outage, so to speak, is useless. And so this brings us to the title of this video, The Blameless Postmortem Culture, which is a culture that a company like Google really tries to foster. And the idea behind that is that when there's an outage, 
instead of blaming whoever caused the outage, don't blame them, hence blameless, and instead do what's called a postmortem. Now, depending on the severity of the issue or the outage, and depending on the team that you're on, this postmortem might be a very formal process or a more informal process. For example, if you're an SRE at Google, a site reliability engineer, then this is going to be a very formal process. If you're not an SRE, if you're just a normal SWE and this was a small issue in your team that wasn't that important but still kind of worrisome, then this might be a little bit more informal. Regardless, the idea is pretty much the same. You gather up your team and you analyze in hindsight what happened with this outage. And typically you write all of this down in a document, that way you have it for posterity so that you can go back to it so that other people can learn from it. And in this document, you try to answer a few questions like, what was the issue? Of course, you want to describe what the issue was. What caused the issue? And here you really want to nail down the root cause. So maybe it was my buggy line of code. How could we have caught this issue? And this is where you start to dig into those other things. Oh, well, maybe we could have caught this in code review. Maybe we could have caught this with automatic tests. Why didn't we catch this issue? Oh, because we didn't have automatic tests. Or, oh, we did have automatic tests, but they didn't have good coverage. Or, oh, we did have great automatic tests or great integration tests, but for whatever reason, they were down during that time when that buggy line of code got pushed to production. So we just got really unlucky. Some other service was down that we would have relied on to catch this issue, and we couldn't do anything about it. Where did we get lucky? Did we get lucky in how we caught this bug? Did we only catch this bug because someone happened to be checking the website at midnight? Did we catch it because a customer contacted us about it? Did we catch it because we read about it in the news? And then of course, what are we going to do to try to prevent this in the future? So as you can see, this entire post-mortem process is really meant to help the team learn from this issue, learn from this outage, from this bug, and improve for the future all the while not making anybody feel like utter shit. And this idea of a blameless post-mortem culture is something that's really highlighted and highly valued at these big tech companies like Google or Facebook. For instance, there's always the canonical example at Google of some intern in the early 2000s, I think, who brought down all of Google search for a few minutes or even an hour or so. I forget what the exact story is. And supposedly that intern, instead of getting fired or blamed or something, they got promoted. Again, I don't know how real this example is, but the idea is that it wasn't really the intern's fault for having brought down all of Google search. It was a fault of the process. That intern shouldn't have been able to do that in the first place. And at Facebook, there's a similar example that they shared with us at orientation, where I think it was some intern. It's always an intern. There was some intern who somehow changed, I think, the placeholder text in the Facebook search bar at the top of Facebook. I think that was the example. And that somehow made its way to production. And again, it wasn't really the intern's fault or whoever Ever did that change, it was more fault in the process. How were they able to deploy such a change to production, to billions of users, without someone or something catching it, preventing them from doing that? Clearly there was a fault in the process, and so instead of blaming the person, you do a postmortem, a blameless postmortem, you learn from these mistakes, and you improve things for the future. This concept of a blameless postmortem culture is something that I think is incredibly important in a software engineering team and a software engineering organization as a whole. And with that, I hope that you found this video insightful. If you did, don't forget to smash the like button, destroy the like button, blame the like button. That thing can be blamed. You can blame it all you want, destroy it, smash it, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next one.